Is it okay to uh, uh, hello? Is it okay to start? Okay. And hello everyone. Uh, today we want to talk about Line's journey road to four million cores in the private cloud. I'm Masahito and I'm Mitsuhiro Tanino from the Align Corporation. Okay, first, the, let me explain the, what is Veruda. Veruda is a private cloud, and Veruda is private cloud platform for line services. Veruda provided, provides EAS layers and also the managed service, like managed Kubernetes, managed da database, and managed Kafka as well. And top of this, there is the per service like function as a service or a CI CD pipeline. This is the Veruda and Lines infra scale. Right now, Veruda provides over 46,000 bare metal servers, and also in hypervisor, there are over 10,000 hypervisors. And on top of this hypervisor, over 100,000 hypervisor, uh, sorry, 100,000 virtual machines are running on top of this hypervisor. Okay, when I talk to the, talk about the line's private cloud, we can roughly separate our cr private cloud history to three phases. First one, startup. Second, expansion period. And third one, new infra period. Let me explain the, what, wa what was the problem at each period and what Veruda solved. In the startup period, before the Veruda, there was line infra problems. Infra provisioning took too long times. Let's say in, in this figure, when the application developer needs any infra infrastructure, they apply the request workflow to the infra team, and infra team does the consultant consult the request detail with application developer, and then infra team set up the infrastructure and serve the configured infrastructure to app developer like this. So as a result, the infra provisioning took almost two weeks, even though just one virtual machine provisioning. And then, of course, you know, the Beruda realized open the private cloud with minimum API set to align developers. VM, bare metal, block storage, like this. After we opened the Beruda service, the flow and communication between app developer and infra teams were changed. From application developer point of view, they create a resource by API or GUI. And then the Veruda automatically provisioning the infrastructure resource, and then a developer can start use this infrastructure. And from infra team point of view, the, their operation it was also changed. First, the infra team basically do the bulk resource management on top of hype on, in hypervisor layers, and also infra team can uh, infra teams only do the administration of the Veruda cloud. So right now, there at that, at that moment there was no communication between infra infra teams and application team. So at the, at that times, we Veruda changed did the culture changes. So Veruda changed infra resource characteristic from a facility to on demand resource and API manageable. So as I said, app team view less communication with infra teams to tell the infra demand. And the infra team point of view, bulk facility management was be able to do. <coughs> okay, then next, expansion period. After we opened the Veruda, we had the another problem. So even though VM block storage like this 
infrastructure was provisioned quickly, but line developer has to install common middleware, middleware set by themselves. So let's say infra preparation was changed from two weeks to 10 minutes. But after that, middleware preparation was no change from time perspective. Let's say that, as you can see in this figure, first app developer can create infra resource by Veruda's API, but after that, they have to, had to communicate to DB administrator in that case, and then DB administrator set up the managed database on top of the virtual machine and the, the, did the, some communications. So at the moment, actually, we know how to solve the problems. We did the similar things to apply the managed middleware preparations. So we opened the managed DB or managed blah, blah, blah resources on top of the Veruda. After that, even though creating the middleware for application service, app developer just call the Veruda's API and ZUI. And then from DB administrator perspective, they just do DB administration on top of the each managed database or managed Kubernetes cluster. And in this open, in the expansion period, actually we had two OpenStack challenges. One is rapid growth of OpenStack scale. So at the expansion period, we opened managed Kubernetes, managed Redis, managed MySQL, managed Elasticsearch, and yeah. And as a result, the number of hypervisor was rapidly growth from 1,400, sorry, 1,400 hypervisor to 6,000 hypervisor within two years. So at the moment, the, this rapid, uh, sorry, this uh, rapid growth required OpenStack deployment topology change and tool changes at changes. And the, at the moment, we noticed that some open source OpenStack API plugin were not measured in the large scale cluster. The one quick example is Kubernetes Cinda CSI plugin. It calls tons of the OpenNova API to attach or detach volume. And Ansible key, Keystone user management plugin doesn't expect there are over 10,000 users in the keystone. And finally, the, let me explain the, what, was, what is a new infra period. Actually, we are in the new infra period right now. So right now, the one problem is siloed technical knowledge of Veruda. So right now, the Veruda become matured cloud in Line's private cloud. But the, some teams can use sophisticated infra management tool to Veruda, like Ansible or Terraform or anything. But some other app developer teams rely on the traditional manual operation. So actually, the, lots of teams have different knowledge level about the infrastructure. So that's why the size of technical knowledge happen. So in order to solve the problems, right now Veruda tried to realize straighten all API stack in the Veruda to follow the de facto standard API set. So the, in order to provision virtual machine, physical machine, Kubernetes, and everything, we tried to like, straighten all the API, API stack, oh, sorry, software stack, to following the De facto standard API. De facto standard means OpenStack API and everything. So by doing this, 
the any app developer who doesn't who are not familiar with the Veruda Cloud itself, but they are as long as they are familiar with Ansible or OpenStack, they can use Veruda without thinking about what is a Veruda itself. So, so this moment, the OpenStack challenges is revisit the OpenStack API philosophy. So one of the OpenStack API philosophy, which we um, we think is unified API to manage varied type of backend resources. So let's say that even for provisioning virtual machine on top of Windows, Linux, and also the bare metal service and everything, we provide one Nova unified API. And also in order to realize it, we renovated some API implementation in Veruda. So the, as a summary, the, there was three periods, startup, expansion, and new infra period. And at the moment, each period has different OpenStack challenges. One is open the ERC API. Second, support 500 rapid growth within three years. And third, straighten API stack. And lesson learned from the seven years of our journey. First one is culture change made drastic improvement. Let's say in order to provision the virtual machine, the time was changed from two weeks to 10 minutes, like that. And technical bottleneck depends on the infra scale. So they, even though when I see only the open stack Nova, the technical bottleneck, we are completely different, you know, basing on the, its scale, like 100 hypervisors or 10,000 hypervisors. And we, real, we noticed that open source ecosystem has strong power, not only the OpenStack itself, but also entire ecosystem among the all open source. Okay, from my side, the, this is a quick journey, our journey for the, our private crowd. And let's, let's pass the mic to Taniro san about to focus on the, some specific technical uh, share. Okay, thanks, Murui san. Uh, from now on, uh, I'd like to explain the major development of the OpenStack related uh, feature for uh, inside the line. First one is the bare metal server management in Builder, and the second one is the Oslo messaging HTTP driver. So let me start from the bare metal server management part. So as for the background, the, in the Builder, we provide the VM and the bare metal server management for uh, bare metal server for the application developer to host the application on top of the virtual machine, also the bare metal servers. And for the VM, we support the OpenStack-based IaaS management system, but the for bare metal, uh, in previous, we supported the in-house server management system. As you can see the, in the bottom picture, so the VM side, we used, uh, we provided the OpenStack API, but uh, for the bare metal part, uh, there was the bare metal API, which was in-house and completely different from the OpenStack API. So as you, you can understand the providing the different API for the developer is a little bit uh, difficult over the problem. So for the developer size, they need to understand the completely different two types of the API to automate virtual machine and VIP network operations. And for the builder operator size, we always need to develop the same functionality for the both of the open stack and the in-house management system. So this was, uh, this increased our operation cost as well. So in order to solve the situation for uh, our builder system, so we started to, uh, we started a new project to improve the parameter server management system from the 2020. That is three years ago. And 
uh, we discussed uh, the, in the team and also the developer side, and uh, here is the requirements for the biometric server management. For the application developers, the, we, need, we needed to provide the unified API for the multiple resources. So uh, by using the OpenStack API, user can utilize the, uh, not only for the virtual machine, but also the parameter servers. And also we provided, uh, we, need, we needed to provide the same functionalities for both VM and the parameter server. So user can utilize the same functionality, not only for the virtual machine, but also the parameter server itself. And also uh, one uh, requirement from the uh, developer side is that they needed the uh, private stock management, which is assigned to the only for the uh, specific user that is not shared in the uh, in the user side. That is a requirement from the developer side, uh, application developer side. And from the uh, requirement of the builder operator sides, we needed to reduce development and the maintenance and management cost as much as possible for the biometric server management system. And also, we uh, already have the existing strong hardware management systems like the Fitch manages the uh, uh, IPMY system and also the Fitch enables to install the operating system on top of the biometric server. So this is a strong uh, requirement. We needed to reuse this uh, strong uh, hardware management system in the new biometric server management system. So from the, this requirement, from the application developer and the builder operators, we, uh, developed, uh, we developed the Nova computer driver called the Nova biometer driver in order to manage the biometer server. And uh, as I explained, so we decided to develop the Nova's computer driver rather than the OpenStack Ironic because uh, uh, OpenStack Ironic already has the IPMI management system and also the OS installation system, but we already have the, such kind of the systems in-house inside the line. So, uh, we decided to not to use the Ironic, and we developed the parameter uh, driver, similar to the uh, Liuba driver. And also, the, we implemented the parameter server stock management mechanism to provide the private stock for the application developers. And also, we provided the future to distribute parameter server for the HA purpose, so application developer can uh, distribute the parameter server into the multiple racks, which uh, allow to enable the HA purpose. Our final one is we pre prepared the CI/CD pipeline to deploy the Nova Compute service, which uses the uh, parameter driver. So let me explain the more technical detail for the parameter computer driver one by one. So the first one is what is the parameter driver, and second one is uh, architecture with a biometric driver, and the uh, third one is how, to, uh, how we uh, deploy the Nova biometric computer driver into the Kubernetes environment. So this is the first one, what is a biometric computer driver? So as I explained, uh, we developed the Nova compute driver, and uh, in the builder system, so in order to prov uh, provide or provides the virtual machine management part, we use the reward driver, and instead for the biometric server management part, we, prob uh, we use biometric driver. So we are using the multiple drivers for the uh, based on the purpose. And uh, the driver communicates with the physical server management system. So as I explained, uh, their uh, OS installation system and also the IPMI <coughs> management system. So the, this biometric driver communicates with uh, this uh, backend system. And also the basic operation, like the create, delete, rebuild, or start and stop, such kind of the uh, biometric uh, operation, uh, instance operation uh, we implemented. So the user can utilize this kind of the operation, same as a virtual machine. And the final one is uh, end user can utilize the uh, biometric servers from their pre-assigned stock. Okay, now the next is the new architecture of the, how the uh, Nova Compute uh, biometric driver 
can work inside the OpenStack environment. So the, this figure shows the uh, instance creation work, uh, instance creation flow when the end user uh, make a request to create a bunch of uh, physical servers. So let me explain the one by one. As for the first step, so the, it's uh, on the left top, a user requests to create a new parameter instance using the dashboard or the API. Then after that, Nova API, which is running on the Biometer Kubernetes service, uh, receives the API request. Then the API request goes through the Nova Scheduler or Nova Conductor. And after that, Nova Scheduler uh, will pick one with the Nova Compute to launch the actual physical server. Let's say, the, so as you can see, the red box is the Biometer uh, Nova Compute uh, port. And uh, let's say, the, one with, uh, right side of the Nova, Com Nova Computer driver is chosen. And after that, the Nova Computer start to communicate to the physical hardware management system, which is on the right side. One is the OS installation mechanism, and the second one is the IP management. So at first, the Nova Compute driver, uh, uh, Nova Biometer driver, uh, try to boot up the uh, Biometer server using the Pixie boot. And uh, once the Biometer server started up via the Pixie boot, then the Nova Computer driver, uh, Biometer Computer driver, also creates the uh, OS installation task to the OS installer system. Then, once the server booted with the Pixie mode, the server gradually gets the OS image from the installation system and starting the OS installation. That's the basic mechanism of the, how the OS installation works for the Biometer server. Here is the dashboard uh, we provide to the uh, developers. So sorry, the, there is a uh, font is very slow, but the, as you can see in the, this server list, we can, uh, you can see the two types of the servers. One is the physical, uh, physical uh, diameter server, and another one is the virtual machine. For example, one, maybe the top four, top five instances, you can see the dot metal, uh, prefix for in the server type that is actually for the Biometer server, and the uh, bottom of three, uh, three they are the virtual machine like the one CPU, one gigabyte, blah blah blah, SSD so, uh, storage like that. So user can understand which one is the Biometer server and which one is virtual machine from the build dashboard. And next, uh, I'd like to explain the deployment procedure of the biometer driver into the OpenStack environment. So this is a very brief uh, figure how we deploy the uh, biometer driver into the Kubernetes environment. So let's uh, explain one by one for the deployment flow. So on, top, uh, on the left top, you can see the biometer operator. So the starting point is the biometer operator. So when the biometer operator, uh, for example, adds the 100 biometer server into the OpenStack environment, they create the uh, GitHub PR pre request, which have the physical server information or the config information related to the 100 uh, physical biometer servers, and the operator push the configuration into the Git repo. And uh, step two, Argo CD uh, watches uh, and uh, syncs the new changes to the Biometer uh, Builder Kubernetes services. So once the Git change is pushed into the repository, Argo CD uh, notice the change and started to deploy the change to the actual uh, OpenStack environment running on the Kubernetes services. And in the deployment procedure, uh, we use the Ansible Kubernetes module to deploy the config map and the deployment on top of the Builder Kubernetes services. And on the left side, you can see uh, we deploy uh, the deployment procedure, deploy the config map, and also the uh, deployment manifest uh, which uh, launched the Nova Compute using the Biometer driver to manage the Biometer server. So, Currently, in our architecture, one Nova Compute pod manages the one physical server. So let's say when we 
uh, a fan operator as the new hundredth uh, configuration changes, the new hundredth port will be launched on the Velda Kubernetes services automatically. And during the uh, deployment, uh, starting up with the uh, biometer services, the, there is a Harbor repository which hosts the container image and the Kubernetes which is the uh, Nova computer image from the Harbor repository. And at last, uh, we use the uh, Nova's OpenStack, uh, OpenStack aggregate to manage the uh, private stock to the end user. So the, this procedure also registers uh, some of the information into the Nova's uh, host aggregate using the Nova API. This is a, a brief deployment procedure of the bare metal server management system. Okay, then now let's, uh, let me explain the next major de uh, development called the Oslo messaging HTTP driver in Builder. So first, let me explain the, what was the problem uh, by using the LabTMQ driver. So uh, in the OpenStack, LabTMQ driver is a major and uh, commonly used in the Oslo messaging uh, project and the uh, driver is widely used and validated. That is working properly. And uh, in the build environment, we have separated RabbitMQ cluster for the Nova, Neutron, etc., like the Grants, Shinda, Designate, etc. And uh, each node of the, each cluster contains a large CPU and memory, like the 32 core or 260 256 gigabyte memory, et cetera, that cluster is very huge. However, due to the large scale of the hypervisor, like the we host the 10,000 hypervisor per one OpenStack cluster, RabbitMQ, uh, RabbitMQ cluster frequently, frequently gets stuck, and uh, it causes the OpenStack whole issue, like the Nova issue or the Neutron issue, et cetera. So we gradually started to consider how to solve the, this issue. So the bottom figure uh, explains the uh, mechanism of the how the OpenStack utilizes the RPC communication through the RabbitMQ. So you can see the right side, uh, left side is the RPC client, like the Nova API, and the right side is the RPC server, like the hypervisor. So in order to communicate the, between the RPC client to the RPC server, at first, RPC client uh, register that uh, sends a message into the RabbitMQ queue. Then the RPC server side fetches a message from the RabbitMQ. So RabbitMQ is the central component, and uh, if the, some of the issue happens in the RabbitMQ side, both of the RPC client and the RPC server cannot work correctly on the OpenStack environment. So we, uh, so that we observed the two problems in, by using the RabbitMQ. One is the RabbitMQ frequently becomes uh, unstable, and also the RabbitMQ itself becomes a single point of failure inside the OpenStack. So in order to solve the current uh, such kind of situation, we uh, started to consider to replace the RabbitMQ driver by using the HTTP architecture. So we developed the new uh, Oslo messaging driver called HTTP driver, and the uh, LAP architecture is described in the, this figure. And the uh, main uh, purpose of this driver is that uh, this driver, by using the driver, so we can eliminate the single point of failure, like the central messaging queue, and the RPC client and the RPC server can directly send a message from a client to the server. That is a major point. So one improvement, so as you can see on the top right, so we use the console to the data store of the RPC server site. So when the RPC server started up, the RPC server tried to register the server information or endpoint information inside the console. Then RPC client, when the RPC client sends a message, RPC client tried to fetch the uh, endpoint information from the console and uh, decides the destination, then make a RPC call to the server. So the point of the disk, uh, how do I say, 
purpose of consul is that the consul only provides the endpoint information, and the data flow from the RPC client to RPC server is direct. Not there, there is no I say, message queue between the client server. Uh, so that is the uh, okay, improvement uh, too. So we can say the, uh, there is no single point of failure by using the direct call. And uh, as you know, uh, for the RPC communication, there are three types. One is the call message, and second one is the cast message, and third one is the fan out. So the call is a uh, uh, type of the mes message to send a message and await the reply. And the cast is just send a message, but it doesn't await the reply. And the fan out is a very, how can I say, little bit different, but the, uh, when you use the fan out, RPC client need to send the message to the all of the destination, like the, let's say, if the Nova conductor sends the fan out message, all of the hypervisor need to get the fan out message. So in order to scale, uh, allow to scale up the uh, fan out message sending mechanism, we split the uh, fan out mechanism application called the HTTP broadcaster, and uh, this application can send the fan out message to the all of the RPC server rapidly. And also the, this software is running, on, uh, running as a deployment, so we can increase or decrease based on the demand. Yeah, this is the last slide. So we, deploy, uh, we already uh, deployed the, this HTTP, also message HTTP driver into the, our production environment, which is the largest one. And uh, in that environment, we have the more than 10,000 hypervisors. And uh, right now, that driver is very working very stably. And also, we recently started to communicate to the Oslo, mess, uh, Oslo project and uh, try to uh, contributing the driver to the OpenStack uh, community. So that this task is still ongoing. So we are, to, uh, we are happy to share the, this status <laughs> to the community. Okay, so that's all for our presentation. Thank you very much. So then, any other, uh, any questions so far? So first, I want to clarify, when you say six million cores, that's the combination of bare metal machines and VMs, right? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 yes. Yes, okay. it's a combination of the bare metal and the virtual machine. Okay, so it sounded to me that you spent a lot of effort converging the APIs of bare metal machines. Um, and I wondered, because I think when our company adopt, adopted cloud, we encouraged people to move to virtual machines. And I wondered why that didn't happen, were there a lot of resistance, and what were still um, the use cases for bare metal machines? Okay, thanks for your questions. Yeah, actually we have the like real some use cases. So Line provides the messaging services like Messenger in uh, Facebook or some things in East Asia regions. So the some of Kafka cluster requires a lot uh, high speed I I O like I O and at the moment virtual machine like do the virtualizations on to the disk access. So that's why the virtual machine is not good for them, like for the over subscriber. How many subscriber we had? One, 10 million, thousand million, over one billion users. Hmm. Over like the, an, another case is Redis cluster as well. The Redis cluster also requires a, a same performance for the all Redis cluster machines. So that's why the, if there are the mix of the virtual machine, the some watch, let's say, inside one Redis cluster has, let's say, um, 10 Redis servers. And in case of one virtual machine hits the noisy neighbor case, the entire cluster performance decreases. So that's why in order to avoid that situations, we use the bare metal server. That's why, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. So usually when people talk about large scale, the kind of scale you're talking about, there's usually three kind of scaling prompt points. Rabbit is one, which you've obviously addressed. The other one is usually the SDN and the SDS um, in some form or another. And I was just curious, like um, what SDN, if you can say what SDN you use and whether or not you use Ceph at, uh, or, or another SDS at this kind of scale. Uh, I want to double check the SDN. I'm asking basically what SDN you use and if you use Ceph as your SDS. So it's, sorry, two questions in one. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I don't get you are, sorry. Software ah, software-defined network, okay, okay. Got it. So actually the, we use the, our own the neutron driver to realize close network or basic uh, data center. And also that we use, uh, we developed another like SL V6 basing the overlay network. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Any questions? Uh, yeah, as a Soko, I'm really looking forward to having this feature in Oslo. I have one question about the biometal driver. Mm -hmm. So in the figure, I saw that you deploy multiple Nova Compute, which maintains multiple biometal nodes. I think we still have some pain about it. I mean, even if you use Ionic as a biometal management, you still need to have Nova Compute so that you have to, you can maintain these deploy the bare metal instances be a Nova API, but we sometimes see some problems caused by the mapping between the Nova compute host and the bare metal host. I mean, if the bare metal host is managed by the Nova compute running on control at zero, and you lose control at zero, then you will lose all of the management of that bare metal nodes because your bare metal nodes is tightly tightened with the, con the services running on compute zero. So, do you have any tricks like uh, to, oh, do you see the same problem in your driver or do you have any tricks to overcome that problem? Uh, so actually the, in the current architecture, so the, for the physical server and the Nova computer is one by one. So the one Nova okay. compute port manages the one physical server. Okay. So if the one Nova computer port gone, that, no, uh, that physical machine is, itself is not I guess, uh -huh. manageable. But, the ones, but the, due to we are using the Kubernetes environment, if the one with the port hits the issue, but the immediately that port is launched again. So normally we do not hit such kind of an issue okay. by using the Kubernetes environment. Yeah, I was recently working on deploying this stuff on top of Kubernetes, and I, I ended up using some stateful set mm. and the host name hacking so that we have state static host names. But yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, having each services per. Yeah, but the one pain point is that like, in order to increase the number of the physical machines, so you need to, the number oh. of the port will be increased. So that we are considering how to decrease the number of the ports and uh, either to use the uh, resource like the memory and the CPU for the Kubernetes as much as possible for the efficiency, for efficient. Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Yep, thank you. Anything else? Okay, if nothing, it just close the session. Thank you for joining. <laughs>